Hi, good evening everyone. Welcome to our very first Parental Stress Centre Parenting Inspirations live chat. This is actually the, um, the very first live chat I've ever done. So I need you guys who are listening out there just to let me know that you can hear me okay, you can see me okay, and I've got this thing going on. <laughs> because I've practiced it a few times on one of our other pages but this is the first time that we've done it so I'm eagerly awaiting one of your comments to let you know, let me know that you can um, hear me and see me okay awesome yes thank you Alex for letting me know and I've got the couple of thumbs up signs it's just shifting across my screen so let me tell you a little bit about how we're going to run this live chat tonight. So I'm going to spend half of the session chatting with you about um, the five ways that you can stop anger in the moment and then I'm going to answer as many questions as I can for the other half of that time so that you can get to apply some of what I'm talking to you about. Now when it comes to anger it's, it's um, it's important that I explain a little bit about how we approach anger management because one of the things that you're not going to find us say is to walk away when angry or take a deep breath or take more time into yourself those sorts of practical things that we hear over and over again and logically we know how to you know what we've got to do when we're angry but we want something a little bit more concrete that we can latch on to because we can take deep breaths, but the challenge is still there. The kids are still fighting, the back chat's still there, the mess is still there in the house, the things that are triggering us is still triggering our anger. Now, the other thing that, you know, walk away when angry is another example of something that we're usually told to do, and that's not always possible, particularly when you've got small children that you can't just walk away from a situation so we want to give you some concrete things that you can walk away with from today's session but before we do that let's have a look at what anger actually is now we may think that anger actually comes from the event that we're experiencing so the child having a tantrum the child back chatting our partner not doing what we're wanting them to do life not going to plan those sorts of things but if it was those things that were actually causing you stress or causing your anger then that would mean that everybody who experienced that event would feel exactly the same way it would mean that every time you experience that event you would experience the same intensity of emotion every single time but we know that that's not true that let's say for example you are going into a news agency with your tantruming toddler and you're just about fed up just about ready to crack because you're so over these tantrums so over having to take your toddler shopping with you and then all of a sudden you found out you won first division lottos do you care about that tantrum in that moment if it was the tantrum that was causing your stress you would react the same way every single time with the same intensity but you've got new information you've got a new story you might be standing there going woohoo I never have to go shopping with you again I'm hiring you a nanny <laughs> so it's not the event that causes us stress it's how we're perceiving that event and what we perceive it to mean about ourselves now everybody experiences their the process of emotion and reaction the same way so we experience event with the five senses we see it hear it touch it taste it smell it and the sensory information is getting sent into the brain for evaluation the brain is essentially saying what is this that I see here touch taste smell have I seen it before have I got a reference point an opinion what information do I have in my database stored that matches what I'm experiencing right now and it's trying to understand so it can determine a response and there's two responses that will come from your evaluation process the first one is how we feel so our emotions and even our physical sensations in the body the brain every time you have a thought releases a chemical into the body and we've become familiar with those emotions so that we're we know that what anger feels like or we know what sadness feels like and we know to label that and also determines your reaction and your reaction will always be with the agenda of pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain so when we look at that evaluation process 
and we look at the things that we're told to do when we're angry, like walk away or take deep breath, those sorts of things. Even when we're looking at how we handle our child's behavior, we're taught to do things like put them in time out or to issue consequences. And while these are all really helpful things to do, it's actually just the end result that you're dealing with here. You're not dealing with the core of why you felt the way that you did, why you reacted the way that you did. And if we're talking about child behavior, while your child, why your child has behaved the way that they've done. The reason why we feel the way that we do is because of how we're perceiving life. So if you want to change how you feel, you have to change the evaluation process that occurred before you had that reaction, that physical response and thus your reaction. So it's really important that we understand that your mindset and mastering your mindset is the absolute key to handling your emotions. So when it comes to anger management, you're wanting to look at the story that you're telling yourself about those events. Because when you can change your story in your mind, you will change how you feel about those events. So what we want to do is move into explaining to you five simple ways. So obviously when we're looking at our story, our evaluation process, that can be quite complex or it can be quite easy to do. And there's very different ways that we can teach you and that we do teach you at the Parental Stress Center how you can change that story, how you can master that mind. But obviously it comes with practice and it comes with learning specific strategies on how to identify the thinking that's causing your stress and how to change it. So today, because we've only got sort of half an hour before I start asking questions, I want to just give you five quick in the moment tips that will help you to handle that anger in the moment when it's already arrived. And we're not going to do it in that practical, usual sense. We're going to do it in the way that I'll give you five tips that will help your mindset more so than practical measures. One of them is practical though. So the first one is to disrupt the pattern that you fall into. So as soon as you recognize yourself labeling an event, so you see your child tantruming, you label it in some way, annoying, um, wish it wasn't there, painful, <clears throat> um, pain in the ass, you know, things that we might say to our kids. We have, you know, different labels that we give things different, it might be annoying, it might be frustrating, it might be pissing me off, it might be had enough, over it, those sorts of things. When you notice yourself labeling an event or having a judgment over an event, the first thing I want you to do is disrupt that patterning because we get stuck in default responses. So we've learned that when we experience an event, the sensor sends the information into the brain, the brain evaluates what's going on and brings up your default response, the strongest response in that moment. So your default response can be, oh, here we go again, or I've had enough of this, or you could be stacking all this stuff that's you know, really annoying you into this one moment. This has happened that's gone wrong, and this has happened, and I've had a really crappy morning, and now this is the icing on the cake. So as soon as you recognize yourself rolling around in a story about the event, I want you to disrupt the patterning by saying something peculiar that completely messes with your mindset. So I remember there was a lady, she may even be on this group, she'll remember the story, that she, at the time that she was doing our Tame Your Temper Challenge, she was actually training her dog um, in puppy school. And she caught herself rolling around in the mud and thinking about how she didn't like an event and judging it and labeling it and getting caught up in her emotions. And when she recognized that, all of a sudden she thought of a command that she had been learning to give her dog in that moment. Oh, not in that moment, but in the puppy training school. And it was, ah, uh ah, -uh, no. And so that was something that she then took on to disrupt her own patterning. That whenever she caught herself going on and on and on and on about this story, this judgment of what's actually happening in front of her, she would stop herself and go, ah, ah, no. So something like that, that, that mentally and verbally disrupts the pattern of thinking that you get involved in. So another thing that you can do 
is you can look at something that you would normally lay, label as annoying or frustrating and label it as something fantastic, this is awesome, or something really peculiar. You might even say, this is really peculiar. Or when you're seeing poo that you're scraping off the floor and you're dry reaching and it's thinking it's, this is disgusting, see it as chocolate. See foods that you don't like and help your kids do the same thing. Pretend that it is ice cream. When you, you because your brain thinks in pictures, you see, and when we think in pictures and we change the picture of what we're seeing or what we're labeling, it confuses the mind. And so you can't get as stuck in those judgments because when you judge something, you have this default response in the body that says disgusting means I feel Ew, disgusting. Everybody can, if I asked you right now to put yourself into a physical state of what disgusting is, we all know where we would go. The body knows exactly what we need to do. We would screw up our face, we'd sort of lean in, we'd go, oh, we'd turn away from the situation. The brain and the mind and body really work together in creating these defaults. And so when you break your labels and judgments by saying something different that the brain can create a picture about, so if you're scraping poo off the carpet and you label it as chocolate, or, um, well, chocolate's probably the nicest one, it all of a sudden lessens the intensity of what you're actually doing because it's the, it's the thing that you're seeing and then you're labeling the thing that you're seeing. So you're seeing the poo, you're labeling it as disgusting, and then your body is associating itself, get, preparing itself to associate physically with the label of disgusting. But if you were to look at the poo, label it as chocolate, and tasty, tasty chocolate at that, not that you're going to go eating it, but tasty chocolate at that, then it changes the physiology in your body. So that's the first step, is to disrupt your patterning mentally. So if you want to write that down, the uh uh, no, or stop, or um, something that just breaks your train of thought in terms of verbally. And change the labels that you give things. So even when we're um, walking around looking at the state of our house, you can change the labels of things. Instead of seeing a messy house, you can see a delightful house. You can see um, wonderful things that I enjoy having. You change the label of it, it changes how you feel about it. So that's number one. The second one is to create yourself some mantras. Mantras that, because sometimes it's, it's difficult to completely change your whole story in that moment and you may need to look at what was I thinking in order to feel this way later on. But in that moment, what you want to do is create a mantra. So my mantra, for example, is Jack, you're in conflict with reality. So all stress is a conflict between how we're thinking and reality. Reality is your child's having a tantrum. Reality is your child is giving you back chat in that moment. Reality is your life is where it's at at the moment. Your child's development is at where it's at. And we get stuck in that story that's in conflict with reality. We think that you shouldn't behave like that, life's supposed to be different, I'm meant to be experiencing something else than what I actually am, I think I'm missing out on what life was supposed to give me, I'm missing out on time out, I'm missing out on respect, um, those sorts of things, you always you know, treat me like this, you never listen to me, nobody ever listens to me, we get stuck in this lovely little story. I call it rolling around in your pit of shit. <laughs> and we get caught up in it and it's all in conflict with the reality of what you're experiencing right in front of you. Reality is, so what am I going to do about it? That's one of the mantras that I use for myself. Either Jack, you're in conflict with reality because it brings my attention back to this present moment. It allows me to come back and look at what's happening in front of me. Because a lot of the time our attention is focused on the past or it's projecting past information into a potential future. So we're never actually here now. 
And so when you catch yourself in that story, in that moment, you just want to bring your attention back to being in alignment with reality, not conflict with it. So you don't necessarily have to have um, caught the story. You can feel when anger has arisen. And whenever anger is there, you're in conflict with reality. So you might even say to yourself, your name, like me, Jack, you're in conflict with reality. And this came from, actually, my husband helped me to coin that mantra. Because I was whinging about the house being all messy, and I was whinging about the kids fighting and not having enough time to do things. And he went, Jack, you're in conflict with reality. It is what it is. And I was like, and it just sort of stopped me in my tracks. And I kind of went, yeah, yeah, I am. So that's kind of something that we say um, in the moment in our household. You know, whenever one of the kids are kind of rolling around and saying, this should have happened and this should have happened and why didn't this happen and why can't I, blah, blah, blah. And I say, you, you're in conflict with reality. We've even got a little plaque that says you're in conflict with reality. You know, so obviously we're traveling around Australia. That's why I have a caravan. I'm in a caravan and there's bunks behind me. Um, so... Obviously, we don't have the plaque with us now, but when we're usually home, that's something that kind of sits on our mantelpiece to remind us to keep our attention in the present moment. So you may also find um, other catchphrases that may work for you. Things like, this too shall pass, or there's value in everything. So what we often find is when we run our 28-day Tame Your Temper Parenting Challenges, or any of our programs, mind you, that participants often find their own mantras, things that really resonated with them, things that stick. So you want to find something that works for you. Often it's the conflict with reality that helps because it helps people to realize that, hey, there's no point rolling around in what should have happened and what was supposed to be and how I'm missing out on this, that, and the other. Here I am right now. That's reality. So that's our second point. First point is to disrupt the patterning mentally. The second one is to recognize or remember a couple of mantras that you can maybe even stick around the house that will help you to bring your attention into that present moment and deal with what's in front of you. Because it's when you roll in that story that's causing the buildup of that anger to arise. So that's number two. Number one, disrupt the patterning. Number two is having your set mantras. Number three is probably my favorite. Number three is all about changing your physiology. Now we've talked about this mind-body connection and how easily your mind can have trained your body to be in a state. You can wake up in the morning, and many of you will recognize this, that you will wake up in the morning already in your pit of poo. So you're already going, oh, here we go again. Same shit, different day. Nobody's going to listen to me. We're going to be running late again. Then I've got to do this. And then I've got to do that. Oh, I don't want to get out of bed. I just want to stay here. That before you've even had that conversation, your body already knows to sit in that state. So... What you want to do when you're trying to change your mind-body connection is physically move those cells in the body in a different way. I challenge you to walk around your house, put your hands out stretched like you're, you know, I'm the king of the world, Leonardo DiCaprio style. Hold your head up high, smile, and say to yourself in a sing-song voice, I am so pissed off right now. These children never listen to me. Oh my goodness, it's just such a terrible morning, isn't it? And put yourself in a physical state of happiness while saying the same story that would normally cause you to be pissed off. And I challenge you, it's another way of messing up that patterning that happens in your body because your body is associating freedom or happiness, smiling with a feeling of I'm feeling good. But when you, you know, are rolling around in your story, if, you, if I asked you to do anger right now, I want you to stop for a second and I want you to put yourself in a bodily state of anger. I want you to think about something that causes you anger and I want you to put yourself in that physical state. Take notice of what it is 
that you do with your face. Take notice of what you do with your body. Take notice of what you do in your facial expressions. I'm really, really pissed off with you right now. I'm clenching my teeth. I'm squinting my eyes. I'm hunching my shoulders. I'm sort of inwardly, I can feel all that tension in my body. My body knows exactly what to do. Now I challenge you, get out of that state, shake it off, shake it off. Put yourself into a state of joy, motivation, inspiration, something that really riles you up. Make yourself laugh. Think of something that makes you really pleased, like even just picture your children laughing or having fun or, you know, tickling or just running around or doing something that you that really inspires you it might be exercise it might be even eating chocolate it could be even having sex something that just brings a smile to your face and makes you feel good and take notice of what your body is doing so what you'll find is that your body opens up your head lifts up you start smiling your facial expressions lift up your whole body opens up to the experience of joy so you didn't really have to try very hard to do that. You can change your physiology in a heartbeat. You don't have to think really hard about it in order to do it. You just did it. And you can switch from one to the other whenever you like with conscious and awareness attention. So when you get up in the morning and you feel, so get really familiar with the physiological habitual states that you find yourself in and deliberately mix up the patterning by changing yourself physiology physiologically so that might even be that you know you might you might even do that with your kids as well imagine what would happen if your kids are fighting and you walk up into the room and you just go <laughs> and then you turn around and walk off do you reckon that would break their patterning they would just be going what what the hell just happened then <laughs> who was that crazy person that just came in here and did that weird thing when we were in the middle of fighting you break the chains and every time you break that patterning you weaken the pattern and so it can't it can't be as strong when you stop playing it over and over again Whenever we learn anything, it comes from repetition and consistency. That's what a habit is, something that I've practiced over and over again. So we get up in the morning, we've practiced our state, we've practiced our pit of shit, we know how to do it really well. We can even expect it. We can say things like, oh yeah, I'm just, I'm not looking forward to this weekend. I just know that it's going to be a shit weekend because I'm home alone, partners, you know, out and about doing what they're doing or working or whatever, and it's going to be a hard day. And so you've already convinced yourself that it's going to be a hard day and your body knows exactly how to do hard and it will rise to the occasion because you've trained it to be that way. But when you change yourself physiologically, so get yourself a happy playlist where, of music that you can just get up and move around the room and literally shake out that pit of poo. <laughs> Literally shake out the cells in the body and train them to a different state of mind. Pump yourself up. Do one of Anthony Robbins' priming exercises where he does this, you know, and actually moves the cells in the body. So you're pumping up the energy in your body. So changing your physiology is so powerful in helping you to change your mindset. That's why exercise is so wonderful. You know, even meditation can be good at doing that sort of thing. But sometimes what we need to do is literally shake it out. So that might mean that you have to just jump up and down on the spot. If you don't have access to mu music or, or anything, you might just, you know, start jumping up and down you might do something like sing your favorite song in your best singing voice ever because what that will do is will distract you from that story that's causing you stress and move you into a different focus point and actually using muscles and using energy to sing that song in your head you may even take the tune of your favorite song and sing out your frustrations I'm really annoyed now, yes I am, and I think these kids should move away from me before I lose it. Something like that, that wasn't even a song, I just made it all up. <laughs> but just don't take yourself so seriously. We need to lift and shift ourselves and take responsibility for our own emotions. You cannot allow 
events to dictate how you feel because otherwise it becomes chance that you ever feel good because reality is life doesn't always go to plan and if you think that events are going to cause you to feel good you're in conflict with reality especially being a parent where there's so many anomalies that get in the way so number one disrupt the pattern mentally by saying something different by catching yourself and pulling yourself up on rolling in that story number two have your own mantras Jack you're in conflict with reality this too shall pass this doesn't mean anything about me we're gonna to get to that one three change your physiology do something physically different with your body and train yourself to a new mind train yourself to feel differently number four mindfulness mindfulness when we think of mindfulness it we're usually thinking about sitting down and meditating and a lot of us don't have time for that even though time is about priorities but when we're in the middle of feeling angry we're probably not being very mindful but a way to bring yourself back into that present moment is to ask yourself questions and the questions that I often ask myself I do this with my kids as well when they're rolling in maybe worry for example I'll say where are you so to myself I would say where am I and the answer is always here how do I know that I'm here because of what I see hear, touch taste smell that's reality everything else is judgment so your reality is actually the experience of the five senses so when you actually reverse that evaluation process so remind you I'll remind you of the, the evaluation process we experience an event with the five senses the sensory information goes into the brain for evaluation the evaluation causes how we feel and how we react so it's almost like we've got to go back to number two where we're at the experiencing stage before we've done the evaluation stage we have to go back into experiencing sight what is it that I'm seeing I don't need to label it I don't need to acknowledge it just even if you did it now if you looked from wherever you are look from one side of the room to the other really quickly and you can't label anything because if you're doing it really quickly you don't really have time to label anything you're just observing just looking at it all keep looking all you're seeing is stuff and when you're in absorbed in the observation of things or even in the hearing of things sometimes hearing can be a really easy one to do because we can't always acknowledge what we're hearing sometimes we need to deliberately hear for example if our child is crying or if our child is whinging and you're resisting it you've got this story created about what that whinging means to you that it's not the event it's the meaning that you've given that event that's actually causing you stress because when you think about whinging it's really just sound isn't it that maybe you could use step one and disrupt the patterning by calling it a waterfall or meditation music what if your child's whinging was like meditation music what if your child's whinging was like waves crashing on a beach wouldn't that make a difference if you can just allow yourself to hear what you're hearing see what you're seeing taste what you're tasting so let's say you're sitting at the table and the kids are fighting and things are going on left right and center you're worried about being late and you're sitting there eating your breakfast slow down and eat like taste what you're tasting smell what you're smelling bring your attention back to as many of the five senses as you can because when you take the labels of things and you come back to the experience of it there is no stress you start to bring your focus back into the present moment and right now is all there ever is the past doesn't exist until you bring it into the attend into the current moment with your attention and obviously the future doesn't exist because it hasn't happened yet all you ever have is right now I mean now oh I mean now oh whoops that's gone too you've only got now and that's even a little game that I do with my kids to help give them the message that 
right now is all we ever have. So sometimes when they're stressing about things, so I remember Ryan was worried about climbing up some stairs once because he's always been worried about looking at see, looking, climbing stairs that are see-through. And I said to him, would you, he said, I want to climb up there, but I'm scared of it. And I said, would you like some help? And he said, yes. I said, okay. So get to the part, so climb, let's climb up and get to the part where you start to freak out. And we got to the part and he said, here. And I said, all right, let's stop. What is it that your mind is doing? And he said, I'm worried, you know, it's so high, I'm worried I'm going to go fall through. I said, okay. So I want you to feel the railing. I want you to observe around you. I want you to look for the safety of this place. Do you look for evidence of you being safe? Does it look like it's shaky? And I just brought his attention to the five senses so that we could make sense of where he is right now because his story was causing him the fear. And when we can come back to the reality of those five senses, it helps him to rationalize what's happening right now. There is no fear in that moment. So mindfulness can be so powerful, particularly when we use it actively. And that's more, I'm a more of an advocate for the active mindfulness. Now I did a Vipassana course um, about 10 years ago, I think it was, where it's um, 10 days of silence, 10 hours a day for 10 days where we, you know, meditated and just really got to hear what was going on in your mind and the five senses were really heightened and so I, I've understood the practical um, the passive mindfulness where you sit and you meditate and you come into the present moment you feel all of the senses and you feel the sensations in the body and that sort of thing and that can be really powerful but I found that active mindfulness particularly when I try when I often go into those default anxiety modes mindfulness active mindfulness bringing myself in the present moment is really really powerful for me so anyone who experiences that anxiety or their kids do mindfulness will be your best friend so that's number four number four is mindfulness where am I here how do I know I'm here because of what I see hear, touch taste smell that's reality everything else is judgment number five this one's a good one. Depersonalize your child's behavior. It's not about you. Often as parents, we get fixated on outcome. We think that we have to get our child's life right. We think that we are responsible for their feelings and their emotions and their behavior 24-7. And while we are responsible for help guiding them and looking after them and trying to teach them with the best information that we have, what we have to understand is that the reason why they behave the way that they do and why they feel the way that they do is because of how they are perceiving life. That you would never blame them for your own thought processes, but it's almost like you're blaming yourself for their processes, their thought processes. And while that may mean that maybe you have taught them a few things that are causing them to behave the way that they are, you know, but that doesn't make you a failure. It doesn't mean that you're a terrible parent. It just means that you both need new information. And so you want to get to work at finding that new information and applying it to your life. You see, what we need to do is we need to get out of our own story and get into the world of them so that we can help them through whatever they're going through what we tend to do and we all do this because we're selfish creatures we're all looking at what's in it for me we're all looking at payoffs we're all looking at pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain so when we see our child's behavior not matching what we think is right we personalize it because we want to control it. and anger is all about control we use anger to control or we feel anger because we're out of control and the belief with anger is that i should be able to do more be more have more learn more control more apply more to get life right so we have a picture in our head of how things are supposed to go and we get attached to that. We've attached our self-worth to it. That only when life goes to plan and meets this picture can I feel good enough. Can I feel like a good parent? Can I feel valuable or loved or respected? 
and we have a history of where that came from. This is why it's important to understand the mindset behind your emotions and not just walk away when angry or take deep breaths because those sorts of things are only going to be valuable until next time the same event triggers the same story which triggers the same emotion which triggers the same reactions. And so we need to firstly depersonalize what's going on in front of you by recognizing that your child's behavior is not about you. It's about how they're perceiving life and where they're at in their brain development. And when you can jump out of it being about you, jump out of the world of you and jump into the world of them, you then start to ask yourself, what must they be thinking in order to feel this way? Then you can start to look at where are they at in their brain development for them to be behaving this way? Where are they at in terms of our family dynamics? How are they viewing their world? How are they viewing their role? Sometimes I feel like I have to be the achiever or the perfectionist or the people pleaser or the organized one in order to feel good enough. And I keep trying to raise these expectations so I can reach those goals. And if I don't reach those goals, I get all frustrated. So what's happening for my child? I wonder if they're starting to feel that they need to do certain things to get love and attention and approval and um, to belong in their family or maybe even in their social environment, depending on how old they are. So when you can depersonalize what's going on for them, you can accept the reality of where you're at. It doesn't mean you'll like your reality. It just means that you're accepting what's in front of you so that you can now free your attention to do something about it. Reality is blah 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 so what am I going to do about it so this is where we can then when we when we've depersonalized it we can jump out of the world of us jump into the world of them and start to understand what must they be thinking in order for them to be behaving this way and then we can come from a place of teaching them understanding them even having some empathy for them because we understand from our experience of life why we do emotions and why we react the way that we react. But when we're in the world of us, we have all these expectations and there's no flexibility there. We have this perception that my self-worth is defined by outcome in some way and my child's behavior is all tied up in this picture of this right life that I've wrapped my self-worth in. So every time I see my child behaving the way that they do, I go into this place of worthlessness and I react. I need to stop my child from behaving the way that they are so that I can feel good about myself. And we don't want to do that because we're teaching them that they are responsible for how we feel. But we're not. They're not, I should say. We are responsible for how we feel. And when you can take care of your own emotional state of being by using these five points that I've given you today, then you will start to be able to help your children with their emotions as well. So the key with what we've been talking about in this live chat really lies in, in mastering your mindset, is understanding the story that's causing you that anger and learning how to change and upgrade that story and doing that with repetition. It's about retraining your default physiological responses so that they align to the new stories that you're training yourself to have. And when you learn to accept reality and go with the flow of life's ups and downs, when you can learn from them, when you can stop personalizing life when it doesn't go to plan or other people's behavior, then you will start to feel more at peace with your life and you won't need to control life so it meets a certain picture. Now that doesn't mean that you won't still want life to go to plan. We always do. We're always going to set goals. We're always going to seek improvement of our lives because that's how evolution works. So we're always effectively going to see what we don't have and want more of what we do want. And so that's all okay. It's never the goal that's the problem. It's the self-worth attachment to it. It's the belief that only when I can get life right, can I be good enough or can I feel good? And that becomes by chance that you ever feel good about life. So the key to changing your angry responses is to keep working on your mindset. 
is to be in alignment with reality learn how to embrace life's ups and downs and learn how to um, feel at ease you won't feel happy about life happiness is just an emotion that happens when life goes to plan so when life doesn't go to plan you're not gonna feel happy about it but you can feel at ease you can feel a sense of I don't like this moment it doesn't necessarily make me feel good but I know that there's value in it I know that it's not gonna last forever I know that this is a teaching opportunity if it comes from where your children are at I know that you know I'm seeing this dynamic with my child's behavior um, and the way they're interacting with me and I know that this is just showing me that we're out of alignment in some way and we need to make some adjustments so one of the things that you may also want to take home with you is parenting is not about perfection it's about awareness and adjustment when we're aware of our mindset and we adjust it when we're aware of the um, habits our children are getting into in terms of their behavior in terms of the way they're perceiving life and we adjust it when we're aware of the family dynamics and when they're heading out of alignment with each other then we need to adjust it but there's going to be times in your parenting career where you don't have a clue what you're doing or you've made decisions in the past that you get to the result now and you go shit probably shouldn't have done that but th that's your reality you've done it so rather than roll around in the mud of how it should have been different, you want to get out of that story and get into the reality is, so what am I going to do about it? So I'm going to move to questions in a minute, but one of the things that, everything that we have been discussing here today are things that we cover in our 28 day Tame Your Temper Parenting Challenge. And we're starting one of those rounds on the 18th of October. So if I've resonated with you, or if you've resonated with what I've been saying to you and how we can start to look at that mindset, let me help you and Michelle, my colleague as well, we're both qualified counselors. We're with you for 28 days to teach you how to understand the thinking and your specific thinking behind anger and how to change that story and then how to jump out of the world of you, jump into the world of your kids and start to help them with how they're perceiving life. And then we teach you a five-step mind track to happiness process to help you get solution focused about the challenges that you're facing essentially about your reality so Michelle is about to post um, she's just posted there I can see what that's all about what we cover how it all works you get um, four uh, 28 daily lessons four weekly videos to watch four live chat sessions with either me or myself mostly I do them but sometimes I'm out of range while I'm traveling at the moment so Michelle does them um, and um, you get 28 days worth of support from both of us through a closed Facebook group so two qualified counselors essentially for an entire month or 28 days and then after that you go into our past I've got a lot of past participants on this group at the moment um, you can after that challenge you go into a closed Facebook group where um, we're still supporting you and the people in the group are supporting you with the same language that you're learning from this program so if that's for you then definitely um, join us this Tuesday and let's get into that mindset and get you changing your mental responses to the challenges of raising kids the physical responses that you have and then help you to then start teaching that to your kids as well and get solution focused about the challenges that you're facing okay so what I'm going to do now is I'm not going to scroll through all of the comments and stuff that um, well, I'm going to start to begin with. But if you've got a question, what is the time now? Time is 6.13. I've got 10 minutes of questions to go. So the first one that I can I get, I will answer. So Katie's just asking, how often do you run them? So we run them every six to eight weeks usually. So after this one, our next one is, mm, I don't know, November. <laughs> Michelle, <laughs> when's our next one after this one? I'm not sure when the next one is. Um, okay, so another Michelle, not my Michelle. Another Michelle is asking, I find my anger comes out in self-defense situations sometimes. Example, three-year-old threw lunchbox at my head. Which of these five tips do you think would help me best with this? It depends on, and, and I understand what you mean because 
I would say the first one would be change your physiology. I would say move yourself away, move yourself in a different direction. I know that when I get hurt, that's usually when I would fly from that zero to 100 really quickly if somebody's hurt me. So one of the things that I find I would do is probably run around, jump up and down, move away from the situation, like physically move my body so the energy that rose up so quickly by being hurt has actually moved really quickly as well because I'm redirecting the cells in my body to do something differently. So I definitely say number three. Um, Michelle, my Michelle has just said that the one after this round starting on the 18th of October is the 22nd of November is the next one. Um, <laughs> Sherry's being very lovely and saying Jackie's courses are terrific. Do it. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. <laughs> um, okay, let me just scroll through. If your questions are coming up, then I'm, I'll get to those. Otherwise, I'm just going to scroll through and see what other questions we've got here. Okay, this is a good one actually. It's not really a question, but it was a comment. And Helen said, depersonalizing when you have someone else personalizing it about you is hard. And this is where sometimes, and I know, I know the Helen that I'm talking to, so I know that this applies to you, but sometimes we can feel that we are responsible, that our self-worth is reliant upon how other people feel about, about us. So I need to be liked in order to feel good enough. And we all want to be liked, let's face it. We all feel good when we're liked, and we all feel a little bit bad when somebody doesn't like us. Um, I myself always have to work with that when we get, you know, some comments here and there about, and usually they're comments from people who've never done any of our programs. <laughs> so when people kind of insult you or um, criticize you for things that you're doing like the biggest one for me would be that we're taking advantage of people who are struggling because we're charging for our courses so I've had to learn that what people think of me is none of my business and it's not about me that when somebody is judging you and somebody is personalized something that you've done you have triggered something in them that already exists so their reaction is their stuff, but your reaction to them is your stuff. So what you've got to do is you've got to ask yourself, what is it that they're triggering in me that needs work here? Why am I personalizing the fact that they're personalizing what my choices? Am I actually okay with the choice that I made? If I'm not, then I just need, I need to apologize, I need to talk to them about it, I need to align with them. But if in my heart of hearts I actually believe what I did was the right thing for me, and I believe I handled it well, then you've got to be your own internal measure of worth. Otherwise, you, you, you're relying on other people to like you and agree with you and have the same priorities of you because before you can feel good enough. And again, it becomes chance that you can ever feel good. So you've got to work on your own self-worth and your own stuff that comes up when somebody else is personalizing something that you've done. Because it's not about you. Their reaction is not about you. It's about their mindset, how they're perceiving life in that moment, and what they perceive it to mean about themselves. Okay. It is hard when it's hubby, but... It's still the same thing that applies, whether it's hubby, whether it's kids, whether it's family, whether it's friends, same things apply. It's already, it's just triggering something in you that already exists. And it's likely that there's a dynamic between the two of you um, where possibly you have taught them because there's stuff going on for you where you think, I have to please everybody. Perhaps what's happening is you're going through a bit of a transition, which I know you are, of kind of honoring your own opinions and your own um you're, you're going through a change where you're changing how you feel about yourself and thus you're backing yourself a bit more you're not caving into what other people want so easily and that can mess up some of the dynamics because at one point you may have taught your partner that you're going to respond a certain way and when we get new information and we change our priorities we change the way that we behave and we can confuse our partners so sometimes we need to realign with our partners the new way that you're doing things and, and explain to them why you're not doing it the old way because otherwise they get confused and then they can get annoyed and pissed off with you. <laughs> um, so Zoe's asked a, a good question as well. If your husband does this, 
how do you just accept that and move on without feeling hurt it is a tough one and I don't I don't know whether you can necessarily I guess the fact that you're feeling hurt says that you know you obviously do care like you know how we walk around and go I don't care what he thinks I'm so over it you so do care because you care about that person and you want them to love you and you want to have especially women want to have the quality of their relationships intact that's why we always want to talk and realign and and take care of those quality of the relationships so I don't necessarily think that you can not feel hurt but I think you can depersonalize it more you can let it go and talk about it at a later date um, it's important to think about what they're wanting what you're wanting and how you can integrate those two together not seeing one person is wrong the other person is wrong but seeing that each of you have individual belief systems you're both going through your highs and lows in life and that's integrating to create a result and things are going to change all the time so conflict in relationships is inevitable but it's what we do with those those that conflict that's important and when we can depersonalize it, it doesn't mean you won't feel hurt because there's conflict happening or because of how the conflict arose or how the conflict was handled but you've got to depersonalize it in the way that you say there's there was something going on for them at that point there's something going on for me in order for me to feel bad about this whole situation so what is it that I want what is it that he wants and how can we come together and and talk about how we can compromise and that might mean that you have to do that at a later date so it's important to have that alignment by the way for those who don't know much about it, my programs we have a whole six week truce program that works at you know relationships and how you can understand what's going on for him going on for you how to integrate to create new results communication negotiation what happened how men think how women think and how we can communicate so men can listen and not get offended how we can communicate with women all of that sort of stuff going on so that's the truce program if you're interested um, okay where are we at all right we've got nine more minutes i'm looking at my my phone because my this is life not going to plan is that my ipad that i was going to use for this is actually very low on juice <laughs> and so was my phone but in the time that i realized that um the phone actually charged quicker than the ipad so i'm using my phone at the moment and i know it's only got like 15 percent so we really do need to stop on the eight minute mark okay so kerry said oh, i find the physical side of motherhood the wrestling in and out of sleep suits car seats makes me hot and short and snappy what's going on there well it depends on what your story is about it so one of the things that we need to do whenever we're feeling any sort of response that we don't like when we're experiencing any sort of event with the kids is we need to say what must I be thinking in order to be feeling this way what is it because really when you look at the reality of it the physical side of it it's just physically moving your body about to achieve results so it's can you know I'm just putting on a sleep suit it's a piece of material that I'm putting on a body um, a car seat I'm putting a body in a car seat and I'm grabbing this strap and this strap and putting it together and I'm having to maneuver this child in a way that works for all of us you know get their cooperation things like that that's the reality of what you're doing but you have a story about that that's causing the physiological response in your body so that might be why does it have to be so hard I just want to get the job done I'm not doing it well enough if they're not cooperating um, I've had enough of having to do this all of the time why do I always have to do it I never get any time out for myself um, you know this is this is just so hard all the time they never cooperate they never listen to me why can't they just sit still while I do all these things there's this whole story that's likely going on in your head that's in total conflict with the reality that a child of that age is probably going to wriggle around a child of that age is going to be heavily motivated by fun and interesting things so when you're doing something as boring as putting on a sleep suit and they've got to sit still they've got so much energy and zest for life they want to have fun they want to explore they want to touch they want to move they just want to embrace life and here we are stuck in our and just want to do this thing I just want to do this thing so I can achieve what I need to achieve and I can feel good about myself because I've done this thing on my to-do list even though there's 300 other things on my to-do list and I never get my to-do list done so I'm never happy and I'm always pissed off all the time trying to get to the thing that I can never bloody get to and you never feel happy and meanwhile they're just wanting to embrace life and have fun with it 
you know so we've got to recognize what is that story that I've got in my mind and how is it in conflict with reality and you've got to move yourself differently to get yourself out of that default state so change your physiology when you're doing it have some pump up music going on turn the car on first and put your favorite playlist on and start singing to your favorite song while you're doing it so you're actually shifting the default patterning that goes on when you are putting your child in the car seat or when you're doing a play suit you know have some fun with it play around with them make what you want them to do more interesting to them than wriggling about you know play with them make it fun sometimes we just take ourselves way too seriously and that just causes us all sorts of stress and anger okay final question okay what would you suggest for a family of people who catch the bad mood of other family members which strategy would you help here please all right if they're catching moods they're not just catching bad ones so they're catching good ones too so that you can when you take responsibility for your own emotional state it's often infectious so you find a way to stay in your own state of well-being and parent from there doesn't matter what's going on around you they don't have to don't put the expectation in your picture box and attach your self-worth to it that they have to feel the way that you feel reality is they sometimes won't reality is and the the news agent example right at the beginning with the tantruming toddler is a perfect example you're cheering you just won god lotto woohoo i'm i feel awesome because i understand the repercussions of that i understand what that means for my life the two-year-old's still having the tantrum because they couldn't have that chocolate bar five minutes ago because they've got different information and therefore they're creating a different physical response so you're not always going to be aligned in how you feel so don't expect that your family always has to be upbeat your family always has to feel good but yes we all feed off each other but often the most powerful thing that you can do for your family is take care of your own emotional state because they will start to model that that did you know that what you say to your children only makes up seven percent of communication they're learning through your physiological responses they're learning through your energy they're learning through your facial expressions they're learning through your body language through your tone of voice how you hold yourself they're learning through so many other examples other than just your words so when you take care of your own physical and mental environment you will automatically start to infect them in that way but they don't have to get it at every single moment for life to be good life to be okay the reality is we are going to feed off each other all the time and that's just the way it goes in families sometimes somebody's going to be pissed off sometimes they're going to be happy sometimes you're going to be pissed off sometimes you're going to be happy but that's just the way it rolls you know take be careful that you're not needing them to be happy for you to feel good because that puts a lot of pressure on other people to change their state for your well-being and they won't ever do that they'll change their state for their well-being because they're not thinking about you and your emotions they're thinking about them and theirs the what's in it for me factor the pursuit of pleasure the avoidance of pain so you have to recognize that it's okay for our children to have emotions emotions are not good or bad they're just indicators of how we're perceiving life they're, they're alarm bells that show us how we're thinking and when our thinking is out of alignment with reality so we want to teach our kids and we want to be empathetic towards our children children's emotions because their emotions are real to them regardless of whether you agree with it or not just like your emotions are real for you so you know what anger feels like you know what frustration feels like and when you say to someone I get it I feel frustrated too sometimes when this happens I know you're really angry right now because you couldn't have that thing doesn't mean you're still gonna give it to them to say oh, I used to get really annoyed too and my my mom or my dad used to take things away from me but you know I'm just trying to teach you that you can't do X Y or Z or I'm just gonna I'm just trying to teach you that you can't always get what you want sorry buddy you know something like that you're still giving them love and compassion and empathy but you're not go you don't have to do that with anger they're still getting that message but in an empathetic way alrighty 
so we're going to leave that here for this evening thank you guys so much for coming tonight i really appreciate it. some really great questions there we're actually going to make this more of a regular occurrence um so this is obviously going to be recorded if you want to watch it again um and it, it'll be posted on this page so um you're quite welcome to watch it again um remember we have our tame your temper challenge starting this tuesday so we can get into the heart of your mindset get into changing it get into looking at what must my child be thinking in order for them to be behaving this way and then moving into the five steps that will help you to get out of your pit of shit get into alignment with reality and then start to look at what do i want how do i get it and what's my plan so if you've loved what we've talked about today and you've not done the tamey temper challenge jump on board you will not regret it michelle and i will be there for you for the next 28 days to completely support you pull it all apart and apply it specifically to your life so thank you again for being here this evening on our first live chat i'm so glad we did not have any technology issues <laughs> but i know my phone's about to die so i'm gonna leave it there you take care guys thanks for being on this page um see you next time bye for now